Here's a typical bunch of kids getting some good, healthy outdoor exercise while at school. But what will these kids do for fun when they get home this afternoon? Odds are they'll go inside to play with one of these things, a Nintendo Game Boy or an NEC Turbo Express. It's hard to find a 10-year-old boy who doesn't love to play video games. Today, we'll take a look at the fascination and the technology of computer games on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by the Software Publishers Association, which reminds you it's a federal offense to copy software. The SBA provides information on how to stay software legal. Funding is also provided by PC Connection and Mac Connection, and by Byte Magazine and Bix. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and with me this week is Paul Schindler. And Paul, we're playing the original video game. This is Pong in its first commercial version called Odyssey. And this goes back 14 years. And this was what a, what a video game console used to look like. Uh, these are what the cartridges here used to look like. They weren't very complicated. Uh, this was the old controller. Uh, if you help me, though, uh, we're going to jump ahead 14 years. And, of course, this is Super Mario on Nintendo. Video games have changed quite a bit, obviously. The question when we talk about computer games and video games, I think for parents, Paul, is their concern that kids are addicted to this. What is your view? Is this a bad thing for kids to be playing this, or is there a good side to it? I think there's a little of both, Stuart. I think, like all good things, video games should be taken in moderation. I have a nine-year-old and a six-year-old, and I strictly limit their daily game playing time. Now, we don't happen to have a video game system, so they play games on the PC and on the Macintosh. That happens to be my preference because I think it builds familiarity with the way the system operates and with the keyboard. However, this isn't to say that I think video game systems are necessarily bad because you're still working at the human machine interface, uh -huh. developing comfort, and some people even say developing reflexes. Right. All right, well, we're going to take a look at the latest technology in video and computer games, both hardware and software. We'll look at the new Nintendo competitors in the video game console market, NEC's Turbo Graphics and Sega's Genesis, and we'll see the newest generation of computer games on a CD-ROM. Now, lest you think this computer game business is just for kicks, Nintendo now holds a kind of national Olympics for players of Tetris, Super Mario, etc. We're going to start out with a visit to the Western Regional Nintendo Finals held recently here in Oakland, California. It was a dream come true for die-hard Nintendo fans. Over 10,000 of them packed the Oakland Coliseum when the Nintendo World Championships rolled in as part of a nine-month traveling extravaganza. The Nintendo World Championships, its first year out, was really a, an idea that's been conceptualized about two years ago, brought out by demand of the players themselves, who seem to be socially interactive. They want to know who the best are. They're playing against with their families, with their peers, their friends. This is a way to bring Nintendo out of the house and into a show, and really give those kids the spotlight that they deserve. The players were divided into three age groups and competed in Super Mario Brothers, Tetris, and Rad Racer. The winner with the highest combined score earned a spot in the finals in Hollywood and perhaps a shot at electronic stardom. The three-day event also featured a power walk that highlighted brand new Nintendo games not yet on the market. Game counselors were also on hand to give tips to kids on improving their game skills. Such innovative marketing has helped keep Nintendo on top. The keys of the success to Nintendo is the fact that they're always ahead of the market. In other words, they're always introducing new games from some of the hottest movies, some of the latest trends. They're always keeping one step ahead of everybody. Figures from Nintendo show it expects to sell fewer units of its entertainment system this year. But by the year end, Nintendo also expects to have a place in nearly 30 percent of all U.S. households. The company's success clearly lies in churning out the popular software titles to run on those machines. I think the uh, success of Nintendo will go on forever, really indefinite, because it's like having a VCR in your home. Once you have the hardware, you have this choice of software. There's some over 450 games now, and with the Game Boy, there's some 700 games out there. So the choice will always continue uh, once you have the game in your home. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Kate McGargy.
Computer games can be educational, and one good example is the newest game from Maxis called Sim Earth. And here to demonstrate the game is designer Fred Haslam. Also with us to show us the latest wrinkle in game software on a CD-ROM is Dave Reardon of Cinemaware. Paul? Fred, when you're designing a game like this, how do you, how do you balance the entertainment values versus the education values? Uh, in this game, we uh, wrote something that we wanted to write that showed a lot of the uh, basic principles of you know, how the planet works. And we hopefully made something that would keep people entertained in the process. All right, give us a look at, at Sim Earth here. Uh, many viewers are familiar with Sim City, and I take it this is sort of the next uh, evolution, if you will, from there. <laughs> yeah, in some ways it is. It has the same basic idea of a game without goals, uh -huh. a game that um, you can uh, pick your own uh, directions. Uh, briefly, this is the planet in evolving and developing from its first molten core stage. Not so, necessarily the planet Earth. No, not necessarily planet Earth. Uh, although that is an option, uh, a scenario you can play. So you can basically play this game from the creation of the planet, if you will, yes, up the, until modern times. Exactly. Okay. Now, eventually oceans would form on that and then life would appear. And uh, this oh. is the same planet a little bit later in the middle of the evolutionary stage. Mm -hmm. And here's a representation of, uh, this is a representation of all the various vegetation on the planet. Here's a representation of all the animals. And uh, you can jump in briefly over here and look at some of the different species that have evolved. And we use a, a pretty standard evolutionary um, chart, you know, what, what creatures come from what. Mm -hmm. Dinosaurs come from reptiles, birds come from dinosaurs. Okay, as you move ahead, I, I take it at any stage, I mean, as player, you can mess around with the variables and change things mm -hmm. and so on. Yes, you can. You can uh, directly interact with the planet. You could, for example, drop, uh, well, drop a meteor on something. Mm -hmm or uh, put in a rainforest somewhere. Yeah, I take it you deal with some of the current environmental issues here? Yes, we do. Some of them, not all of them. So when you put in a rainforest, uh, then the, the planet itself and the life interact with that, and uh, it either grows or shrinks depending on what would actually happen under those circumstances. That's right. Now, to look over here and find where the cities are located. Oh, there they are. And on this demonstration planet, uh, it turns out people weren't the winners, is that right? Yes, that's right. The, uh, the reptiles became intelligent in this one. Hmm. One of the fun alternatives to try and do is to try and pick a, a class of animal and make that the intelligent life. Insects, for example, hmm. is a, a very good one to try for. Now, uh, this planet is developed with, using only bio, solar, and hydro energy. It has never touched fossil fuels. Huh. And I'm going to give them free reign to use that right now. And show you. And guess what will happen. And show you <laughs> kind of what happens to the planet. So, we're ticking off uh, geologic time here now on a planet that just started using fossil fuels. Right. Actually, we're up to the point where we're going in uh, tens of years. And uh, you can see the atmospheric uh, temperature. And as you watch, it'll slowly increase. And uh, this will have a, a dramatic effect on the vegetation. The yellow is uh, desert. Yeah, a little greenhouse, a little desert. Yes, and it'll start, the desert will start to grow. As I said, games can be educational. <laughs> we want to turn over to David now and take a look at what you, your newest thing from Cinemaware and explain what the hardware is so we know what we're looking at. Well, we're looking at a standard PC with a CD-ROM drive attached to it. Now, this can either be a standalone CD-ROM drive or in some of the new computers that uh -huh. actually include the drive. Okay, let's take a look at the game you're going to show us here. Okay, the first thing we're going to see here is the... Uh, the title screen. This is Defender of the Crown. This is our Robin Hood story. Right. Uh, Cinemora basically takes our favorite inter movies and makes interactive uh -huh. versions out of them. In this particular one, uh, you're trying to become the King of England. Okay. Now, the thing that you'll see first is that, and hear first, really, is that this is a full orchestral score coming off of the CD-ROM. Mm -hmm. uh, we went back and actually orchestrated the whole thing for uh -huh. this version, and the music is quite spectacular. I'll just click through this quickly now. Now, you get to choose to be one of these uh, four knights, uh -huh. if I can get the mouse up here. And My then he will respond. Sword and lance shall bring the Norman dogs to heel. <laughs> so that's, that's also that, that's, with that's CD also ROM coming off the CD-ROM yeah. too. You get the voice of the character, which is really key to uh -huh. making it movie like. Now here's a little storytelling. Forest, you are greeted by your old friend Robin of Loxley. <laughs> Many years have passed since you served with Robin. And so there's men. our friend Robin, and he will come to our aid three times in our search yeah. to become the king. Now you can form alliances and you can attack other castles and well, so on. What about the action part here? Well, we're going to get to that right here. Guys? Sure. Okay. Um, now here's the map of England. You see the existing castles. You also see your resources. And then I'm going to have some options here. Now you can see I can uh, hold a tournament, go mm -hmm. raiding, and so on. So I think the first thing I'll do is I'll gather everybody and, and hold a tournament here. 
So Are by, you picking up some of the video from the CD-ROM as, as well? Well, all the computer code is on the CD-ROM, oh, that's correct. Yeah, so we have better animations like this. And then you'll see the trumpeteers come in here with the big fanfare. And uh, I'm just going to click through this so that we yeah. can get to the thing. Now, here we are. Uh, Wolfric is a, a, a decent uh, jouster. And we're going to pick an opponent. The tournament begins. Again, the animation is a lot better than we can do because we just have more space yeah. on the disc. I'm going to pick Ed Edmund here. And we're jousting for land instead of, or for fame rather than okay. instead of land. And now you're going to see the movie shot of him riding out. This is us. A little establishing shot. Yeah, a little establishing <laughs> shot. And then we're going to cut to the player's point of view on the horse uh, for the, the the actual joust. Now, see, I have control of the oh, lance here. That's your mouse moving the And that's my mouse moving the lance. And he's oh, I think he got me. I, I think not, it does think, look I'm, like you missed him. I'm toast. Yeah. <laughs> And then you'll hear a little audio feedback here about how you did. Ah, uh, thus ends your day in the lists of Ashby. <laughs> you were not champion, but your deeds will be remembered. Leaving yep. for home, you vow to bring glory to your name. That's great. So that's Defender of the Crown CD-ROM version. That's, that's correct. All right. Well, there's no question that kids are fascinated by video games and computer games, but why? Well, we went to a video game arcade to find out. The road to success is a bumpy ride fraught with complicated twists and turns. But ask any of the kids here why they play, and the answer they give is simple. It's pretty fun. It's kind of hard, though. Well, I just like playing it in school. It's fun, like, because you're, like, playing basketball and you can punch each other. This video game arcade in Mountain View, California, is typical of those scattered around the country. Children pile in shortly afternoon on weekends to match wits with an electronic bad guy. For about 75 cents, they shoot, punch, and hammer their way to victory. The store manager says it's a way for the youngsters to unwind. The adult goes out, he socializes, he relaxes with his friends. Well, they come here after school, relieves tension, and they're able to have fun. The child needs a place to vent frustration. And it's better to vent the frustration playing one of these games than to go out and vent the frustration on a pier and end up maybe in trouble with the local authorities. And that we don't want. This arcade boasts about 60 game consoles and it rakes in over 2,000 tokens every week. That's 25 cents per token, but not all of that money comes from the kids. The kids come here and they can do practically anything and I'm a grown man and I can't do this. And it frustrates me, but it's a lot of fun, you know. The arcade occasionally uses gimmicks like a birthday or retirement party to pull in customers. But what could be the real reason they come to play video games at an arcade? I'm kind of bored of my Nintendo. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Kate McGargy. Well, Nintendo has sort of owned the video game market for the past several years, but new 16-bit game machines from NEC and Sega are challenging Nintendo. Here to show them off are Al Nielsen, Vice President with Sega of America, and also Bob Faber, Vice President with NEC Technologies. Paul? Al, help us understand the differentiation between these game systems and the same games played on PCs. What are the relative advantages of, of playing a game on a game system? Well, the important thing is that the game systems really are optimized. We've built the graphic chips to really work well with games in terms of moving objects quickly around on the screen, really increasing the resolution of what you can do, the mixing of colors, really putting them all together uh, on a more optimized basis. So you're throwing all the processing power into doing one particular exactly. task. All right, speaking of which, uh, you've got a couple games up there on your Genesis machine. And, and, and I guess what, what our viewers are interested in is how this is really better than what they've seen before. So if you can sort of focus on that as you, you run through a couple of games. Well, the first game I have here is Michael Jackson's Moonwalker, which was actually designed by Michael himself. The important thing was really trying to make his animation-like quality, cartoon-like quality uh -huh. in a video game, not small moving characters show you what we've been able to do and really first of all it's a new genre of video game dance video games okay. or music video come to life we put the quarter in and we start off here in the video game does 16 bit give you more detail faster motion better music all, all of, of the them. above yeah. and first of all you have real digitized voices michael's here is trying to save these kids who've been kidnapped listen to one of the girls there she says michael it's an actual digitized voice in the game Michael's moves. First of all, the characters are much, much bigger, much more highly detailed. 
in terms of the types of things that you can go and do. Look at the backgrounds, very, very detailed. And of course, you really do recognize the personality of it. If you didn't tell me who that was, I could recognize that's it's Michael Jackson. It's not hard to tell yeah. that that's Michael. But all the fun things that you can go and do. One of the things that we've done in one of our commercials is really take Michael's videos and put Michael videos together uh -huh. with the game to show how realistic mm. they are. Look at this guy here uh, taunting Michael with the pool cue. You know he's bad and he's after him. You can't do that on an 8-bit uh -huh. system. Uh, in terms of pricing, uh, what's the uh, console cost and what do the cartridges cost each? The cartridges are $49.95 on average. The Genesis system here costs $189.95 the game. Okay, we have one more game uh, we have time to take a look at. Sure. If you could switch that over there, Al. The one game that we have is um, Mickey Mouse starring in the Castle of Illusion. Is this the first Disney character in a video game? Yes, uh -huh. uh, in, on the 16-bit system. Yeah, yeah. He has been on other video game okay. systems over the years. But the important thing is this really demonstrates the capabilities of what you can go and do with um, the 16-bit system. Here's Mickey Mouse. And if you take a look, he really looks exactly like himself. Yeah. We haven't gone and sacrificed any of the detail on the character at all. Is this new this year? This is brand new. It just started shipping within the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And I want to show you just some of the wonderful animation here of Mickey. He's just walking along. And then the beautiful, brilliantly colored backgrounds mm -hmm. as he walks in and the game begins. Here so is. you're playing off the uh, Disney Animation heritage exactly. here. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's pretty classic. Now watch this. Yeah. There he is, and he's just you know waiting for it. One of his old moves from the cartoon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Now he's pretty close to the edge there. Let's see. You know he might have a little problem. Uh oh. <laughs> Oh, look at the emotions on his face. Yes. You know, that's what's really making the difference between this generation of video game system and the, you know, generation. Yeah, and, and the relative depth of that background, too. All right, I, uh, you've shown us what 16-bit can do. I want to move over to, uh, to Bob now and take a look. You've got a CD-ROM player, not a CD-ROM, but a CD player, in fact. A uh, compact disc player hooked up to your NEC unit. We want to take right. a look at what additional uh, capabilities that adds to a, uh, a video game. What you're able to do with the CD player that's never been able to be done before is increase the graphical content and also have real live music, uh, digital music and voice uh, equivalent to what would be on a CD or on a video disc uh -huh. uh, for graphics. So the whole game is coming off the CD. I mean, the, the, the graphics, the, the, the code, the music. That's right. We use the CD instead of a cartridge as the storage medium for the gameplay. Uh -huh. And that comes off immediately into the system. And then the data for the music and for the, the voice and for the uh, animation comes down in yeah. a streaming path from the disc. And what's that extra interface box cost? Is that very expensive to get into this? I mean, assuming you already own a CD player. Uh, I mean, I'm well, you have to buy the CD player to go with the system. Right. It's $399. Uh -huh. All right, I see the game is up here. Describe what's going on here. East, the ideal utopia. This is the introduction of the Once world East. So and what's revolutionary about it is that we're able to have, as you can hear in the background, a, a real description from a person who brings the player into the game and into the world and brings them in and gives them the sense of realism and a sense of a real community that hasn't existed before. So you've got a storybook reader here, which obviously you can't put on a cartridge. Exactly. Yeah. It's, How much is the game? The game itself is $60 retail. Mm -hmm. And, and I guess the you, you got pretty sophisticated graphics paradise. coming off that. They're coming off the CD also. That's right. They come directly off the CD. To the empty mm -hmm. of this is an adventure uh, game. Uh, it's an adventure role-playing game. What it really does is push the technology of uh, interleaving data and audio together. Uh -huh. It's it's pushing the pioneer the area. Are there many titles out now on the CD years. form for the? NEC? We have six titles out uh -huh. now on the CD, and, now, and we'll have. Uh, beginning next year, uh, one a month uh -huh. uh, or more. Bob, we have just about a minute left, and I know you have one other cartridge, got a standard 16-bit game. If you could show us what that looks like sure. on your uh, NEC console. The second game is called Bonk's Adventure, and it's a real hit game. It's uh, one of the biggest games of this year. Uh, Bonk is a lovable character, and again, he's taken advantage of the 16-bit Rather graphics. than a crude, faceless creature, what we have here is somebody that, in the same sense as a Warner Brothers Daffy Duck uh, cartoon, uh, uh, shows some, some facial personality. Yeah. That's right. He's got a real personality. You'll see what happens when he gets hit. His eyes get big. He uses his head. He's a 
cave dude whose only weapon is his head. Yeah, so really watching this, I mean, you're looking, at, if you don't mind, a kind of Mario kind of thing only, but with more personality, more characters, which you're able to get in here with, That's with right. the 16 That's right, more bits. realism, more yeah. depth, greater colors. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Well, what is the best game system, and should you let your kids play them? Well, we'll ask an expert in just a moment, so stay with us. Joining us now is Russell De Maria, video game analyst and expert and author, as we can see, of four books on video games. Welcome, Paul. What is the difference, in your opinion, between the PC platform and the uh, video game cartridge platform? Uh, which is better? Better is a hard one to answer. It really is a matter of what you want to play. Uh, there is some difference, and the main difference right now is in the complexity of games. Uh, I think you've seen something with Sim Earth uh, that that will be on uh, some video game consoles mm. eventually. But right now, you tend to see more of the shooting games, the action games, and some role playing, which is starting to get very complex on the video game consoles. Differences are not so great. Looking at the video game console part of it, I mean, every parent's running into that store now with the kids trying to figure. Well, I don't know from Nintendo and Turbo Graphics and mm -hmm. Sega and all this stuff. Uh, how does a consumer make a decision? I mean, what's the right kind of game environment to get into? Can you answer that? It's a hard one to answer because there's a lot of technological dif differences between the games. But one of the things that I always tell people is look at the games themselves. If something excites you, that's probably the system you want to get. And you may have to make some choices because there will be exciting mm -hmm. games on all, all systems. It's the same old computer story. Start with the software exactly. and get the hardware that will exactly support that. exactly the same principle. Yeah. Let, uh, I'd like to get to the question that Paul and I started out with at the very beginning because the concern is about the video games and almost addiction, as you know, that you, young kids and certainly boys have for playing a lot of these video games and computer games. Uh, is it bad? Is it good? What should a parent do where you've got a kid who just won't stop playing the games? My feeling is that uh, the sense of addiction, which is really more of an obsession, is something that comes from environment and from a lack of communication. I really like to see parents actually talk to their children and say, what are you doing here? Mm. And you'll be amazed to find out that children will say, oh, I'm doing this and that and the other. They'll find out there's a lot of procedural thinking going on, even in action games. And the more you're interested, the less of an issue it becomes. We all know that children make issues out of things that we object to. Do you limit the game playing of your own children? No, I've never had to. The only thing I limit is if they start to get too worked up in the game, get frustrated, I have them calm down and stop, slow down. But as far as the other thing, I have never had to. They play outside all the time and they only play games some of the time. Quickly and last point, what about the violence in some of these games? Does that concern you? It does concern me a little bit. I see games as a platform to the future with simulations and, and learning, and I think we're going to have to deal with what people want. Violence seems to be part of it right now, mm -hmm. but I think it's leading to much greater things. Russell, thanks very much. That's Thank our look you. at video games and computer games. Stay tuned now for this week's Computer News. In the random access file this week, rumors are flying that Apple Computer will introduce several laptops in 1991, including a seven-pound color system. The lightweight portable is to be based on Motorola's 68030 processor and will have 8-bit color video technology. Seven major computer manufacturers, including Tandy, Fujitsu, and AT&T, are attempting to set a de facto standard for multimedia by releasing similar systems that support multimedia extensions to Microsoft Windows. The announcement means improved hardware support for a clearly defined multimedia platform. This should make it easier for software developers to create multimedia applications. Motorola's 68040 microprocessor is finally available. The million transistor chip has been delayed almost a year. The 68040 chip has been plagued by technical difficulties, particularly with the uh, multiprocessor functions. At the same time, Next Computer has started volume shipments of its 68040 based Next Station and the new Next Cube machine. 040 upgrade boards are also available for users of 030 based Next Computers. Taking a look at this week's top 10 software titles for the Macintosh, Mac Connection reports that After Dark is in the number one spot, followed by Disk Doubler. In third place is Adobe Type Manager, and Semantic Sam is fourth. And in fifth place is Quicken for the Mac. Rounding out the top 10 are Correct Grammar, Mac Utilities, Microsoft Word, Where in Time is Carmen San Diego, and Suitcase 2. Apple is trying to fix a bug that slows performance of complex applications in several Macintosh models. The bug is in all models of the Mac 2CI, 2SI, 2FX, and LC. 
Apparently, it only affects applications that place unusually high demands on the Mac Memory Manager. Toshiba plans to market several versions of a high-speed notebook computer with a processing speed three times faster than those currently available. They will feature a fluorescent side-lit display for greater brilliance. Toshiba also plans to introduce a new laptop with an advanced color display in the first quarter of 1991. Time now for Paul Schindler in this week's Software Review. One of the most popular uses for either the PC or the Macintosh is the creation of banners. Until now, the programs that created banners were fairly simple-minded. Banner mania has changed that decisively. The big problem has always been dreaming up ways to make a banner unique. Now, they've taken care of that here by automatically cycling through many of your options, first in an animated opening screen. You have a choice of layouts, small over large, large over small, medium over medium. There's a variety of prepackaged color choices, or select your own, and the list of effects is seemingly endless. The program will cycle through them by itself if you wish. If the program gets close to what you want, lock down one aspect and just allow the others to change. You have the choice of a variety of fonts as well as a variety of effects within the fonts. Both the effects and the font list are so long they run off the bottom of the screen. There's also a number of ready-made banners as well. Banner Mania $60 from Broderbund Software in San Rafael, California, and is available for both the PC and the Mac. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. Microsoft doesn't expect to release DOS 5.0 until sometime next year, but if you can't wait that long to find out about it, pick up Banton's new book, The PC Configuration Handbook. The appendix covers key changes, including a new utility enabling most of the operating system to be loaded into the high memory area or extended memory. The book also covers installation, which appears to be an easier job than in earlier versions. And finally, have you ever thought about how much a business meeting really costs? The Institute for Better Meetings has released a software program to tell you just that while you meet. The product, called the Meeting Meter, looks like an old-time taxi meter on your PC and updates the total fare every tenth of a minute. The fare is based on the meeting participant's actual or estimated salary. A budget can be preset, activating an alarm when the meeting has run out of money. And that's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. I'm Kate McGargy. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by the Software Publishers Association, which reminds you it's a federal offense to copy software. The SBA provides information on how to stay software legal. Funding is also provided by PC Connection and Mac Connection, and by Byte Magazine and Bix. For a transcript of this week's Computer Chronicles, send $4 to PTV Publications. Post Office Box 701, Kent, Ohio, 44240. Please indicate program date.